discovery which has not yet been published. It relates directly to the black communities across America. I'm, after here, I'm going to Bimini. As she said, I'm also going to speak at the Washita Conference again in Louisiana about this. But before I tell you about that, people will say, well, big deal. So what, why is history important at all? History is extremely important. Imagine if, if I could take from each one of you as an individual everything you knew about your life up to last week and just erase it. Where would you be? You, you'd be lost. You, you'd be incompetent. You wouldn't know how to plan for the future. And you do the same thing with a people. If you erase their history or you don't tell enough about their past, they also become incompetent and they can't fulfill the future. And that's why a lot of people in the black community have felt, well, how come all of the dreams of the civil rights movement aren't yet fulfilled? And one reason is because this history is still suppressed. It still isn't taught. But there's been a recent discovery which is going to blow the lid off of all that. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Peace. I'm Rami Salam El, and I thank you for joining us. Today's lesson is going to be on the United Nations, the organization of the American states, and uh, what they can do for so-called blacks, which are really Moors, um, once we correct our status and we are representing or presenting ourselves in our proper person, also known as impropria persona. Um, but before I get to the clip of Barack Obama speaking on uh, the United Nations, um, I want to first read the definition for indigenous as well as Indian. Um, because these are going to play a pivotal role in our understanding. Um, indigenous, native, born, growing, or produced naturally in a country or region, not exotic as corn and cotton are indigenous to North America. Synonymous with original, native, or aboriginal. Then I'm going to read the definition for Indian. And this is uh, coming out of Webster's Dictionary of the English Language, the Unabridged Deluxe Edition, uh, page 930 and 931 are what I'm reading from in case you want to look it up. Um, an Indian, a native of India or the East Indies. Did you hear that? Let me read it one more time. Indian. A native of India or the East Indies. And see, in these days and times, uh, a lot of people have been led to believe that Indians are native to America, but Indians are native to India. Understand? But let's continue because uh, something is very interesting. Number two, a member of any of the aboriginal races of North America, South America, or the West Indies, originally so named from the belief held by early explorers that these regions were part of Asia. Indians were originally so named from the belief held by early explorers. Those early explorers would be, uh, you know, quote unquote, Christopher Columbus, uh, 1492. Just, you know, look those up if you're not aware. Uh, but we're calling the people, the aboriginal, the indigenous people of uh, the Americas, Indians, because he thought this was India. America, speaking of this. Um, and we just have to get that straight because Indians are from India. Americans are from America. And we'll put that on the record, too, before we move over to Barack Obama. And that is coming from American Dictionary of the English Language, Noah Webster, 1828. It's kind of it's difficult to find a definition of American, but if you look in this dictionary, it spells it out for you. American. A native of America. Pretty simple, right? Gets a little more interesting. Originally applied to the aboriginals or copper color races found here by the Europeans. 
but now apply to the descendants of Europeans born in America. So the true Americans are aboriginals or natives or indigenous people of America that was found here by the Europeans. Then Europeans began calling themselves Americans and then calling the aboriginal people Indians. You see the you see how they did the switcheroo? Boom boom. Now we're Indians from India, right? Interesting. Um but without further ado, let's hear some words from Barack Obama. And as you know, in April, we announced that we were reviewing our position on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And today I can announce that the United States is lending its support to this declaration. The aspirations it affirms, including the respect for the institutions and rich cultures of Native peoples, are one we must always seek to fulfill. And we're releasing a more detailed statement about U.S. support for the Declaration and our ongoing work in Indian Country. But I want to be clear. What matters far more than words, what matters far more than any resolution or declaration, are actions to match those words. And that's what this conference is about. That's what this conference is about. That's the standard I expect my administration to be held to. So we're making progress. We're moving forward. And what I hope is that we are seeing a turning point in the relationship between our nations. The truth is, for a long time, Native Americans were implicitly told that they had a choice to make. By virtue of the long-standing failure to tackle wrenching problems in Indian country, it seemed as though you had to either abandon your heritage or accept a lesser lot in life. But there was no way to be a successful part of America and a proud Native American. But we know this is a false choice. To accept it is to believe that we can't and won't do better. And I don't accept that. I know there's not a single person in this room who accepts that either. We know that ultimately this is not just a matter of legislation, not just a matter of policy. It's a matter of whether we're going to live up to our basic values. It's a matter of upholding an ideal that has always defined who we are as Americans. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. That's why we're here. That's what we're called to do, and I'm confident that if we keep up our efforts, that if we continue to work together, that we will live up to this simple motto and we will achieve a brighter future for the first Americans and for all Americans. So thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. What's very important to understand is that there are plenty of organizations, plenty of um, documents, such as the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People uh, via the United Nations, that are already established and ready to provide assistance to us as indigenous people. However, when we call ourselves blacks, African Americans, we remove the status of being indigenous and we replace it with that of slaves being imported to America from somewhere in Africa. We still don't know exactly where don't know what nation, you know, quote unquote, blacks come from. This is why it's important that we identify ourselves properly as Moors. Um, but enough of the jokes. Let me go ahead and read some of the, uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People just to further cement um, the point and the reason behind calling ourselves indigenous people or calling ourselves Moors 
to be more specific, Moorish American, to be even more specific. Uh, and you can find this if you just uh, type in the search engine Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People. It'll come right up. Um, or if you go to the United Nations, you can find it through there, through the documents uh, section. Um, Article 1. Indigenous people have the right to the full enjoyment as a collective or as in individuals of all human rights and fundamental freedoms as recognized in the Charter of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and International Human Rights Law. Um, Article 2. Indigenous people and individuals are free and equal to all other peoples and individuals um, and have the right to be free from any kind of discrimination in the exercise of their rights in particular that based on their in indigenous origin or identity. Uh, that's where it gets a little interesting. We're going to go down to Article 4. Oh no, let's go to Article 3 first. Indigenous people have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status. Political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Very important. Article 4. Indigenous peoples, in exercising their right to self-determination, have the right to autonomy. That's A-U-T-O-N-O-M-Y. Do some research on what that word means. Or self-government uh, in matters relating to their internal and local affairs, as well as ways and means for financing their autonomous functions. Article 5. Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinct political, legal, economic, social, and cultural institutions while retaining their right to participate fully if they so choose. This is key. If they so choose to participate, they can participate fully, participate fully in the political, economic, social, and cultural life of the state. So indigenous people can operate on their own, free and independent. And if they so choose, they can also operate fully in the same, uh, the political, the economic, the social um, uh, life of the state, like the state of California, for example. Article 6 is a key. Every indigenous individual has the right to a nationality. I wonder why that's in there. Let me read it one more time. Article 6 of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People from the United Nations, which the United States of America is signed on to. Every in indigenous individual has the right to a nationality. Indigenous individual. Not a black. Not an African American. Not a person of color. Not a Negro. Indigenous. Such as a Moor. Moorish American. Understand? Let's continue. And I'm not going to read all of these because there's a lot of articles to go through. So uh, I humbly ask for you to look this up for yourself and do some research and read through every single one to understand what rights you are guaranteed on an international level once you correct your status and you stand up in your proper person. Um, Article 8. Indigenous peoples and individuals have the right not to be subjected to forced assimilation or destruction of their culture. States shall provide effective mechanisms for prevention of and redress for any action which has the aim or effect of depriving them of their integrity as distinct peoples or of their cultural values or ethnic identities. B. Any action which has the aim or effect of dispossessing them of their lands, territories, or resources. Any form of forced population transfer 
which has the aim or effect of violating or undermining any of their rights. Any form of forced assimilation or integration, any form of propaganda, any form of propaganda designed to promote or incite racial or ethnic discrimination directed against them. It's powerful. Um, Article 9. Very key. Indigenous people and individuals have the right to belong to an indigenous community or nation in accordance with the traditions and customs of the community or nation concerned. No discrimination of any kind, no discrimination of any kind may arise from the exercise of such a right. Read that one more time. No discrimination of any kind may arise from the exercise of such a right. Powerful. So what, this is your rights as being indigenous, original, native to your respective land or territory. For America, it would be Americans, the copper color races. Moors, that is. Moorish Americans to be more specific. Um, let's go down. I'm going to just read a few more. Uh, let's go with Article 16. Indigenous people have the right to establish their own media in their own languages and to have access to all forms of non-indigenous media without discrimination. State shall take effective measures to ensure that state-owned media duly reflect indigenous cultural diversity states without prejudice to ensuring full freedom of expression should encourage privately owned media to adequately reflect indigenous cultural diversity um, let's see i'm gonna read it. just a couple more just a couple more in article 18 indigenous peoples have the right to participate in decision making in matters which would affect their rights through representatives. It's very key, so you have to be organized. Through representatives chosen by themselves in accordance with their own procedures, as well as to maintain and develop their own indigenous decision making institutions. Hmm. In Article 19, states shall consult and cooperate in good faith with indigenous people concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free, prior, and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. So, you know, this, uh, this Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, oh, well, actually, one more, one more, last one. Article 22. Particular attention should be paid to the rights and special needs of indigenous elders, women, youth, and children, and persons with disabilities in the implementation of this declaration. States shall take measures in conjunction with indigenous people to ensure that indigenous women and children enjoy the full protection and guarantees against all forms of violence and discrimination. Powerful. And you see... Once you know your rights and you're in your proper person, meaning you know who you are truly, then you can exercise and you can um, use those rights, uh, such as the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, to help restore your culture, to help live freely, um, even in uh, the United States of America, for example, or whatever nation or country you may reside in as indigenous people. The key being you have to be an indigenous person, or a natural person, just to be clear. But you have to be indigenous. Blacks, it's not indigenous. Politically, legally. Understand, this is not, this is not just a matter of semantics or wordplay. In law, you have to be specific. If you say that you're black, if you say that you're African-American, if you say that you're a person of color, if you say that you're a Negro, then you are taking on that political status, that legal status 
of a slave or descendant of a slave, human property from somewhere in Africa, supposedly. That's not indigenous, especially not to the Americas. Um, now we're going to get to the organization of the um, uh, American states. And this um, organization, I must say we have to be particularly careful as it is pushing democracy and especially here in the United States of America um, with regard to the American Constitution for the United States um, that was set up as a republic if you go through the quote-unquote Pledge of Allegiance Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the you see it doesn't say democracy and if you look in the Constitution the original Constitution you won't find the word democracy in there at all. So I just want to put that as disclaimer out there so that you are aware and conscious when you see that word democracy being used, especially with regards to the United States of America. Understand there's some trickery going on. And I, and I actually did single out uh, what democracy means and what republic means. But that's something that I want you to look up for yourself so you can see it for yourself. Uh, you don't just have to believe me. Um, uh, and with the Organization of American States, let's go here. You can find it at oas.org. And what is very interesting, especially for Moore's study, um, the same Panaman. Pan American Conference of 1928 that Noble Ali attended. Um, from that, over time, uh, the organization, I forget right now uh, what it was originally labeled as, but it developed and morphed into what is now known as the Organization of American States. Um, and they have a draft American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, they're apparently still working, um, you know, they're still working on this, uh, this declaration. So it isn't set in stone yet, uh, which is even more of the reason why, specifically speaking of our indigenous people here in the Americas, why we need to, um, step up to the plate as an organized body and represent ourselves um, in this organization to help guide um, to guide the organization and, and especially with the indigenous people um, and the declaration on the rights of indigenous people uh, I'm still gonna read a little bit of it uh, just so that you can get an idea um, and uh, here we go I'll read article 2 full observance of human rights indigenous people and this is from the organization of american states indigenous peoples have the right to the full and effective enjoyment of the human rights and fundamental freedoms recognized in the charter of the oas the american declaration of the rights and duties of man the american convention on human rights and other international human rights law and nothing in this declaration shall be construed as in any way limiting or denying those rights or authorizing any action not in accordance with the instruments of international law including human rights law um, we'll go down article 3 indigenous people and communities have the right to belong to indigenous peoples in accordance with the traditions and customs of the peoples or nations concerned same kind of language that was in the United Nations Declaration um, uh, Article 4, Legal Status of Communities. Indigenous peoples have the right to have their legal personality fully recognized by the states within their systems. Article 5, Indigenous people have the right to freely preserve, express, and develop their cultural identity in all its aspects, free from any attempt at assimilation. The state shall not undertake, support, or favor any policy of artificial or enforced assimilation of indigenous peoples, 
destruction of a culture, or the possibility of the extermin extermination of any indigenous people. Once again, blacks don't have this right. Indigenous people, Moors have this right. And all indigenous people all over the world. But I'm just specifically speaking to the Moors um, that uh, are still identified and are still calling themselves Blacks, Negroes, Colors, African Americans, ETC. Um, let's go down to Article 7. Indigenous people have the right to their cultural integrity and their historical and archaeological heritage which are important both for their survival as well as the, for their identity of their members. Indigenous peoples are entitled to restitution. Oh, now. <laughs> restitution. That's a very interesting word. I want you to look that up in the law dictionary. In respect of the property of which they have been dispossessed and where it is where that is not possible, compensation. Watch out now on a basis not less favorable than the standard of international law. Lastly, the state shall recognize and respect indigenous ways of life, customs, traditions, forms of social, economic, and political organization, institutions, practices, beliefs, and values, use of dress, and languages. Uh, let's go down to education, Article 9. Indigenous peoples shall be entitled to establish and set in motion their own educational programs, institutions, and facilities, to prepare and implement their own educational plans, program, curricula, and materials, to train, educate, and accredit their teachers and administrators. The state shall endeavor to ensure that such systems guarantee equal educational and teaching opportunities for the entire population and complementary with national education systems. When indigenous people so decide, educational systems shall be conducted in the indigenous language and incorporate indigenous content, and they shall also be provided with the necessary training and means for complete mastery of the official language or languages. The state shall ensure that those educational systems are equal in quality, efficiency, accessibility, and in all other ways to that provided to the general population. The state shall take measures to guarantee to the members of the indigenous peoples the possibility to obtain education at all levels, at least of equal quality with the general population. The state shall include in their general educational systems content reflecting the pluricultural nature of their societies, and the state shall provide financial, the states shall provide financial and any other type of assistance needed for the implementation of the provisions of this article. I mean, you know, let me just read this last one, then we're going to go to the brother Frank Joseph. Very, very amazing information. Um, article 10. Indigenous peoples have the right to freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, and spiritual practice and to exercise them both publicly and privately. The state shall take necessary measures to prohibit attempts to forcibly convert indigenous peoples or to impose on them beliefs against their will. In collaboration with indigenous peoples concerns, the states shall adopt effective measures to ensure that their sacred sites, including burial sites, are preserved respected and protected when sacred graves and relics have been appropriated by state institutions they shall be returned the state shall encourage respect by all people for the integrity of indigenous spiritual systems practices sacred ceremonies expressions and protocols let me i'm going to read this last one article 11 in then we'll get to the video. I just got to get this on the record. Family relations and family ties. The family is the natural and basic unit of societies and must be respected and protected by the state. Consequently, the state shall recognize and respect the various forms of indigenous family 
marriage, family name, and filiation. In determining the child's best interest in matters relating to the protection and adoption of children of members of indigenous peoples, and in matters of breaking of ties and of other similar circumstances, consideration shall be given by courts and other relevant institutions to the views of the peoples, including individual, family, and community views. It's very powerful. Um, and so I'm reading this because as Moors, we have these rights that we're entitled to as an indigenous people. Specifically, Moorish Americans, we have these rights at being in the Americas, North, Central, and South, anciently known as a Mexican. But I don't want you to just believe me. You know, I don't want you to just believe that we're Moors or that we're indigenous to this land. You know, I want you to look it up for yourself. They came before Columbus, Ivan Van Sertima. The African presence in ancient America. I'm going to just read the back. I want you to get the book for yourself and read it. Um, they came before Columbus reveals a compelling, dramatic, and superbly detailed documentation of the presence and legacy of Africans, quote unquote Africans, in ancient America. Examining navigation and shipbuilding, cultural analogies between Native Americans and Africans, the transportation of plants, animals, and textiles between the continents, and the diaries, journals, and oral accounts of the explorers themselves. Ivan Van Sertima builds a pyramid of evidence to support his claim of an African presence in the New World centuries before Columbus. Combining impressive scholarship with a novelist's gift for storytelling, Van Zerdema recreates some of the most powerful scenes of human history. The launching of the great ships of Mali in 1310, 200 master boats and 200 supply boats, the sea expedition of the Mandingo King in 1311, and many others. And, and by the way, Columbus was said to have came here in 1492, so that's just so you understand. In They Came Before Columbus, we clearly see the unmistakable face and handprint of black Africans quote unquote black in pre-Columbian America and their overwhelming impact on the civilizations they encountered. So I want you to check that out. But even more than that, let's see some footage and you can hear and see for yourself the truth. But these Mali kings, 900 A.D., they set out because they had a legend that there had been blacks going long before them. It was only a legend. It was only a myth. And it was on that myth that they chanced and they went across the sea and it worked out for them. But that myth traced all the way back to an even earlier black contact between Africa and America. And I'm talking about America now, not Mexico, but what we call now the United States. And this relates to this new fabulous discovery that is coming out. About 200 years before Christ, up until right at about the time of Christ, in other words, about 2,000 years ago, there now appears that there were wealthy West African and North African blacks who left Africa on a pilgrimage and came, if you can believe this or not, but there is solid proof for it now, to Southern Illinois. Now I'll explain how that happened. In 1982, our time, there was a, a guy who was going along Southern Illinois. He was a, a cave hunter. And he was, I don't know if you're familiar with Southern Illinois at all, on the Ohio River, it's just honeycomb with caves, thousands of caves. They have not all been explored by any means. And he was involved in sports for hunting in caves. It's done all the time. It's rough work. These, sometimes these caves are very narrow. He went into, to make a long story short, he went into this cave that had no one had ever seen before. And he squeezed through a very narrow entrance, and all of a sudden it turned out into an enormous room. And in this room, he found great sarcophagi, or coffins, coffin lids, made out of stone. The walls are engraved with all kinds of 
stories, uh, picture stories of men and women in old uh, costumes from the ancient world. And then on the floor he found stacks of thousands upon thousands of these black rocks that were beautifully engraved with the profiles of people, not Indians, people from, the other, from other parts of the world. Some of them were white, some of them were Asian, but hundreds, hundreds are of black people, all in profile. They are made on a, on a type of rock which is found really mostly only in southern Illinois in caves. This rock is like a clay. You pull it out of the ground and you have like a stylus or a pen and you can, you can draw on it real fast. You can draw profiles and letters and then as it dries it turns into a hard rock and these rocks are piled up on the floor of this cave. Now this man's name is Russell Burroughs. He's not an archaeologist, he's just a, a spelunker, he's a cave enthusiast. He brought these out over time. They're very difficult to bring out because the cave entrance is so narrow. And he's brought out now almost 10,000 of these magnificent tablets. They're very crude looking as rocks are concerned, but the drawings are beautiful. And they show the profiles of black people, some with scarification, which is West African, uh, mostly with not that, some with specifically West African robes, which are still used today. Uh, some will have a man on one side and a woman on the other. Some will be entirely women. It has a, a script. Each one of these 10,000 have a script associated with these pictures. Nobody's been able to translate the script. Well, since 1982, this place has really been contested a lot, but finally some professional archaeologists are involved, some top archaeologists, and they have verified that it is all authentic, and they have dated it now, and there's going to be a lot of information released in the next few weeks and months about this find. Who are these people portrayed in this cave? Uh, not all black, but a lot of them are black. Some of them will show like a, a black man with a kind of a sailor's cap, and in the background will show like a ship or a fish. It seems as though they're portraying a captain or a sailor of some kind. It's now understood, it's very involved, complex. You'll see the whole story in our magazine in the next few issues. It appears as though around the time of Christ, just before the coming of Christ, in Rome, there were a great many mystery cults. And these mystery cults, they were because they were secret, not because it was a mystery. It was secret. And in order to get into this mystery cult, you had to go through different levels of initiation, like the Freemasons, you know, which are not unrelated to it, believe it or not. There were many mystery cults like this, the cult of Osiris, the cult of Isis, and a lot of other cults we don't know about. And then to get into these cults, we do know you had to pay money, you had to be fairly well off, and the final stage of all these mystery cults, you had to go on a long pilgrimage, a long quest. All that cost money, but you would go on this long quest to a sacred place. And at that final sacred place, you go through an initiation of some kind. And when you went through that initiation, you were finally a member of this mystery cult. And these mystery cults were all the same in that they promised the individual who went through this initiation eternal life. You didn't die. You, you survived after life. And these levels of initiation showed you how your soul made this progression. All that's been lost, although some of it has survived in Christianity, which is basically the same, that you don't die. If you are a good Christian, you go eternal life with Christ. And some of these ideas apparently were shared in common. Now these blacks apparently, they all look, <laughs> they all look well fed. There are no starving people portrayed in this. And they all are with jewels and everything. So they're, they're well-to-do people. That fits what the archaeologists now think is that these wealthy people, no matter what their race was, but a lot of them were black, would participate in this mystery cult, would cross the sea and come to a cave, this specific cave in southern Illinois, was the holy place. It was far away, it was hard to get to, it was extremely secret, it was part of the mystery cult, but they knew about it. Apparently the Romans knew about it. This is like a Roman cult that was open to anybody that could afford to go through it and they went through their final initiation, whatever it was in this cave, and when they were finished, they had their portraits drawn. It's just like you have your picture taken when you graduated, right? And then in the Catholic Church today, we still have things called votive candles and votive statues. Like you'll go to a church and you'll light a candle, 
and you leave part of yourself there, or you have like a statue of uh, the Blessed Virgin or St. Joseph, and you leave it there. A little inexpensive statue. The same idea seems to be working here. You would go through this mystery cult, you'd come all the way across the ocean on this great hard quest, all the way to southern Illinois to this strange cave. You'd go through these rituals, and when you completed them, they would draw your portrait real fast, and put your name on there, and then they would store it in the sacred cave. You didn't take it with you. That's why it's done on kind of crude stone, although the drawings are not crude. The drawings are excellent. And, the and these inscribed tablets were put in this cave because it was like the votive part of you. You left that part of you there. So when you went back to Rome or Africa or wherever it was, part of you was still in this, in this cave. And it is no hoax. It was one time I saw it, maybe it was a hoax, but now they found over 10,000 of these. They're beautifully done. It's, far, it's beyond anybody to hoax this stuff. So there, here's this earlier migration. And because it was part of a mystery cult, it was not well publicized. And so we can kind of excuse historians for saying, well, there were no Romans or blacks or anybody at that time going across the ocean. But there were. The reason they didn't know about it because it was part of this mystery cult. Something of that myth, though, must have survived all the way into Mali times, up into 900 AD, when those kings of Mali decided to cross the ocean. Those two black migrations to the Americas are not the only two. There are two more, two earlier ones still. We go way back in history. Around 1,000 years before Christ, 3,000 years ago, it's such a long time ago, it's hard to even imagine. There were people called the Phoenicians. These were Canaanite people that are mentioned in the Bible. They were half Semitic and half something else. Who knows what they were? They were very well traveled. They were very great seafarers. And they employed all kinds of races on their ships because they didn't really have any particular homeland. They were always traveling, all, going everywhere. They were the first to go around Africa, known to go around Africa, 900 B.C. And it's known that they employed many blacks on their ships, not as slaves. They had no slaves on board their ships. But they did have sailors. They did have captains. Captains. Did he just say... I thought I heard him say Canaanites. Did you hear that? Let's continue. Just, just keep listening. We'll come back in a second. These people definitely crossed the ocean also, also to Mexico. It made a very strong impact on a civilization called the Olmecs. The Olmecs, that's just as a name for this very, very early civilization. The earliest known civilization in Mexico. And everyone thought at one time, well, it's just an Indian civilization until 1861. In 1861, a farmer was plowing his field, came across a, a very strange domed rock, a black rock, and he couldn't dig it out. The more he dug down, the bigger this rock got, until he dug the entire thing away. It took him weeks to dig it away. And it turned out that he unearthed a nine-foot-high statue of a head, beautifully done, of an African, not an Indian at all, all the portrayed features of a West African man. From that time until recently now, there have been 11 of these giant stone heads. Let's see it. i give you an idea how big they are. Uh, they're an average, well, there's 11 found now. They're between 6 and 9 feet high, and they weigh 40 tons apiece. They're magnificently carved. While these were being found, more of the Olmec civilization was found, and a temple was discovered that had... Also, the same type of people, these West African people, portrayed as kings and, and warriors. So, when the first archaeologist found these, he says, well, these are probably just blacks that got blown across the sea and were enslaved. But you don't make huge heads uh, portrayed with crowns of your slaves. You know, these were obviously uh, regents, powerful people. How did they get there? that long ago, because those heads are dated to about 3,000 years ago. So far as is known, there was no black civilization then. That came later. It appears that these were sailors and captains working with the Phoenicians. Maybe they jumped ships. Maybe they got wrecked, shipwrecked. But somehow, they got along fine with this Olmec community, so much so that they rose to become the leaders of that society. One of the other new things that have been found is that the heads, the black heads of these great Olmec kings wear a strange kind of headgear. It comes down halfway by the ears and circles the entire crown of the head. There's nothing like that anyplace else until they found 
we're starting to find now these old leather crowns that were studded with gold and brass that were used by the early kings of Mali. So only two places in the world have the same strange type of crown amongst the Olmecs in Mexico and West Africa. So here again, there's this parallel. Now, even older than this, I mean, they talk about, you know, uh, our ancestors uh, coming over on the Mayflower. This is, beats them by thousands of years. There has been a, another stupendous discovery. I mean, it's, they're coming so thick and fast, probably because our technology is expanding, as you know. And as our technology expands, more, we're able to find out more faster. Over in Japan, and this relates to what we're talking about, was found an underwater city, the first ever found. It's right off the coast of southern Japan, by Okinawa, where the great battle was fought in World War II. And this underwater city extends for 311 miles on the bottom of the ocean floor. The deepest one is 100 feet, the deepest building is 100 feet, the others are 20 and 40 feet. And they show streets and uh, boulevards, they show pyramids, I've got photographs I'll show you tonight. These photographs are, have not well been publicized, but they will be. Uh, great plazas, huge steps all underwater. Now, this place is probably related to another old legend, and that is of the lost civilization of Mu. Mu was supposed to be a Pacific Island civilization that sank long ago, but before it sank, and while it was sinking, it was not a, a fast or catastrophic end for the most part. While the oceans rose when the ice melted in the glacier. The glaciers that covered all of this area, you know, at one time. 10,000 years ago, they began to melt very rapidly. And when they melted, they flowed into the oceans of the world and they raised the ocean level by about 100 feet. So this civilization goes back maybe 10,000 years. Hard to believe, but the evidence seems to suggest that the city at the bottom of the sea goes back that far. The reason I mention that is because all of the traditions of Mu and all of the research that have been done, has been done into it in our show there were three races of people on Mu. There was a Caucasian people. I'm going to use these terms, by the way, scientifically, not sociologically. This is just to define a people. A Caucasoid people, a Negroid people, and a Mongoloid people. Excuse me, not a Mongoloid people. A brown people. I don't even know how we put them in. And that was considered only legend, only myth, that these three races were on there. They equally shared power politically. The reason why they did it was part of their solar religion. They believed that the sun has different phases of the year, and so they should share power. As the sun shares power with its light on the earth, so these three races had to share power equally. The reason why they believed that was they believed God manifested his power and his identity in natural law, which you see the flowers growing, the sun, the stars. You can't see God, but you can see what God does. That's God's law. So if you live in harmony with God's laws, you see it in nature, you're doing God's will. That's what these people believe. And so by having the sun at different phases of the year, you share different power. Sometimes the whites, the white people, the Caucasoids would be the power. Sometimes the blacks would. Sometimes the brown would. That's their tradition. When this land sank, this high civilization brought some of its ideas to different parts of the world. The brown people became part of what is now Polynesia. And the Polynesian, I can tell you for a fact, the Polynesian legends are thick with stories about Mu. The Hawaiians have a people they call the Mu who were there before they were. The white people apparently uh, didn't do as well physically. They were more or less wiped out or they dispersed and intermarried with people in China, it appears. But the blacks, however, went in two directions. And we, this is beyond legend now. Now we're moving into hard science. When Mu sank, or when Mu was in the process of being inundated by this great rising wave of water, they went in two directions. They went out to what is now known as Oceania and became a people known as the Negritos. And they also went towards Mexico and impacted this Olmec civilization. And the reason why we now know that is because there was a genetic trace done. You know about DNA now. That's getting a lot of play in the paper. DNA means you can trace the genetic code of a people. The genetic code of the 
And there are, are still native blacks in Mexico. That's never been explained by archaeologists before Columbus arrived. DNA tests done on them. DNA tests done on the bones of some of the Olmec people, not all of them, the ancient remains, show a definite genetic trace, not to Africa only, but across the Pacific. When they found that out, they said, that's got to be wrong. It just doesn't matter. Oh, there are no black people out in the Pacific, but there's this definite trace, lineage, that could trace out towards Hawaii and beyond Hawaii. Then they began a worldwide match of DNA. Well, who does this, who does this, do these strange black people, who do they match up with? They don't match up with Africans. They matched up with the Negritos in Oceania. It looks now, scientists believe, there was a central point from which they went in both directions. So this is a marvelous heritage. And, you know, some people say, well, you're a white guy. How can you talk about stuff like this? I get flack from this on both sides. The purpose of our magazine is to tell the truth about what happened to our country and our continents before Columbus. And if it shows that there were white Vikings here, and there were, we tell that. And if it shows that there were Asians here visiting, Chinese here visiting Mexico, we'll tell about that. And if there were blacks here, we have to tell that too. That's all part of our heritage. And I think it's, I think it's thrilling and exciting for, for all of us. I th it, it's remarkable. So what we're telling you, I mean, this is just in a nutshell, and you're going to be seeing a lot more of this, not just in our magazine, believe me. You're going to be seeing this on TV. It, it's, it's bound to burst out because it's now it's really known the archaeological community. You've had four of these major impacts that the black people have made to the Americas, not only before Columbus was born, but before even Spain or Italy existed. That's, that's the kind of, of roots that are in this country. And by knowing that, and the more you know about it, it's an empowerment. You're, you're really rude. You're, you have got a heritage which is more than slavery. Sure, there was slavery, but that's not all. That's a small part of it. Long before that, there's a heritage of kings, seafarers, religious missionaries, and they were all here. But it happened so long ago, there's just so little of it left. And, and that's, basically, that's basically my story. Um, the, what connects it up is even the word more, because it's pronounced differently in different parts, of, even of Africa. And they call themselves more, mu, mur. There's all variations of that. So that even the name mur. Oh, excuse me. We're back. This uh, this is the the lost continent of Mu, by the way. By James Churchward, Colonel James Churchward. Uh, I want you to do some research on it, but I'm gonna just read it back for you. Uh, Mu, the motherland. The motherland. Don't they recall it now? Never mind. A lost culture, which was the center of civilization, some twenty five thousand years ago hmm. and our brother uh, our brother Joseph Frank Joseph he was saying that Mu was uh, dated back 10,000 years that says 25,000 years it's very interesting keep digging and digging and digging and the farther you go down the rabbit hole more truth seems to appear we're gonna go ahead and close it out with the Holy Quran of the Moorish Holy Temple of Science, divinely prepared by Prophet Noble Jew Ali. We're going to go to chapter 47, which is titled Egypt, Egypt, the Capital Empire of the Dominion of Africa. And we're going to read from line number six. The Moabites from the land of Moab received permission from the pharaohs of Egypt to settle and inhabit northwest Africa. They were the founders and are the true possessors of the present Moroccan Empire with their Canaanite, with their Canaanite, Hittite, and Amorite brethren, their family. Canaanites, Moabites, family. Moabite is the ancient name for Moors. Canaanite Moors family. It's probably why Noble Jew Ali named the first temple in 1913 the Canaanite Temple. But let me continue reading. With their Canaanite, Hittite, and Amorite brethren who sojourned from the land of Canaan seeking new homes. Their dominion and inhabit inhabitation 
extended from northeast and southwest Africa across the great Atlantis, another ancient civilization, another ancient land, even unto the present North, South, and Central America, and also Mexico and the Atlantis Islands before the great earthquake which caused the great Atlantic Ocean. Let me read that one more time. Just one more time. Understand Atlantis is ancient. Their dominion, the Moabites, Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, the family, and inhabitation extended from northeast and southwest Africa across the great Atlantis. So before there was this great, uh, this Atlantic Ocean, there was a land called Atlantis was in there even unto the present North, South, and Central America, and also Mexico and the Atlantis Islands. And a little bit further down on uh, number nine, it reads, According to all true and divine records of the human race, there is no Negro, Black, or colored race attached to the human family, because all the inhabitants of Africa were and are of the human race, descendants of the ancient Canaanite nation, from the holy land of Canaan. What your ancient forefathers were, you are today, with, without doubt or contradiction. Powerful. I wonder how he knew about this way back then. And there was no Google. There was no quick pull it up on your smartphone. Somehow Ju Ali knew about this. To bring it all home. Moors, Moorish Americans, we are ancient, we are the descendants of an ancient people that are indigenous, not only, you know, it's the Americas, yes, that's important, but really and truly we're talking about the entire world. Our civilization dates back that far, our people date back that far, that's where the term Asiatic comes from. And we can't claim that as blacks. We can't claim that as African Americans. We can't claim that as people of color. Those people don't exist in the ancient times. You know, those are those are slave titles or names that was placed on us recently. We have to be who we are. We have to know thyself, if you will. And once we do that, we can reclaim our vast estate, as a wise man once said. I hope you're listening. Peace and love.